Okay, so we've been going through coal, especially Wyoming and, and um, um, Montana coal. And so we've we talked about how it, uh, the history of coal and the different types. And then we talked about how uh, it's mined and then, and then they convey it to the, um, the tr transloading station. So now we're gonna talk about the rail part of it, how they get it from the transloading facility to the, uh, you guys are seeing a coal car, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Hey, let me let me stop you for just a minute. Sure. I was driving around today and I went past the Kenilworth Channel between Lake of the Isles and Cedar Lake. And I was gonna go over the little hill to Cedar Lake. And here comes a train with a Union Pacific engine inbound and a whole string of NSP cars. What the hell is going on? Um, and and it was coming in on the Milwaukee. <laughs> yeah, coming in on the Milwaukee. Uh, yeah, they still use it. Really? So yeah. now were those cars, were they loads or were they empties? Uh, if they're going eastbound, then it would be uh, loaded. It, it, it was just one C-44 on the front. Okay. A whole string of, uh, you know, and I didn't wait around, you know, I was driving around, so I just made a U-turn and got out of there. But, uh, but I, I just, whoa, I didn't, I didn't expect that. NSP cars. Well, what they, they also do is um, um, they, they bring a, a train into the King, LNS King plant, and then they take off before they take it over to the plant. They take off about, oh, say, I don't know, 20 cars, something like that. Yeah. And they and they haul it out to uh, Marshall, Minnesota. There's a there's a uh, sugar beet plant that uses coal, and they're burning Western coal. And so Mar yeah. uh, NSP is is remarketing the coal to this company because they can't they can't bring in a, a unit train by themselves. Oh, okay. And so that's that what they do. Sometimes with smaller customers, they'll carve out a piece of the train, and and take it over there. Then they unload it. Okay. And uh, they were the silver aluminum. Cars? Yeah, I don't even remember. I just saw the NSPX and I made my made yeah. My, that's what I'm, my, that's what they are. And they're the uh, I'm going to talk about them, but they're the Ortner uh, rapid discharge that you can use yeah. either at a rotary dump or at a regular dump facility. And oh, okay, so the one in Marshall, is, I think, is uh, is is a um, I think that's a bottom dump. Okay, so anyway, so that that explains why one C44 could handle it. It probably was pretty short train then. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Thanks. And, and so that that would have meant that um, uh, that came from Wyoming via the the UP then. Yeah. So okay. So they bring yeah, it up then to uh, probably probably in uh, St. Paul, and then they would haul it out there to Marshall and then bring it back. Okay. So, and then bring it back on on the Twin Cities and Western. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. So. Um, I was I was surprised at um, that that uh, railroads actually go back to 1606 in England. I didn't know it went back that far. There was the Wallington Wagon Way uh, is the first documented use of rail transport, and they had wooden rails and flanged wheels. And so, in a museum in England, they have these right, and they had stone bridges. Yeah, later, yes, yeah, they're the stone uh, sleepers, as they call them. Yeah. And then these are wood, and then the uh, uh, the rails are, you know, and so they, um, and, and and they learned quickly that, that like in England, where it rains, especially central England, you know, here's here's a, a horse trying to drown, <laughs> a wagon yeah. in the mud, uh, not going to work. And so they figured out, gee, if we put a couple of rails down, uh, uh -huh. then the horse can haul it. And yeah. so they they uh, they worked on the idea, and then they would build the mines. Usually, were upgrade from the from the the towns and the and the ports where they'd export the coal. And so here's a guy going down grade, and he's break got them. obviously some kind yeah. of a break on this uh -huh. thing. And then he brings the horse along, and then at, uh, when the thing is emptied, probably had to empty it by hand. Uh, mm -hmm. But anyway, they would take the horse and they would bring the the uh, wagon back. This goes back to the 1600s. I had no idea that 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 uh, uh, trains per se went back that far. I'll bet I'll bet you that wagon. It's got that big wheel in the lead, yeah. And and that tilted front panel. I'll bet you dime that thing dumps toward the front. Maybe it does. 
Yeah, it could. Sure. It would yeah. sure make it more efficient. Yeah, it would. Yeah, sure would. Yeah. And then they loaded colliers down below, and then they took those up ah. to the various cities, especially London. Hmm. So it, it uh, goes back a long way. Yeah. Um, here's another museum that's in central England, and, and here they had different things. They tried um, all sorts of different things. Here's here's uh, regular wheels, but they have L shaped L shaped rails. Now that would the problem here is the it, the switches would be hard to do, and and the rails would be more expensive. Uh -huh. um, and then and then what was more common in the in the uh, late 1700s is they went to wooden. Um, uh, big wooden things, uh, either on wood here or like you were saying, Bob's uh, stone sleepers, and yeah. then they had uh, flanged wheels, and then they had a strip of iron here. But as yeah. we've heard about, they this problem with the strip of iron, especially when they got into the passenger trains, is these strips would bend up and okay. can't go into the cars, so you didn't want to sit by the window because it could get dangerous. Yeah, right. But finally, in the um, uh, in the early 1800s, they came up with the, the, the iron T rail and they figured out that they need to have a big base to hold the rail up and also to distribute the load because it's pretty heavy. And they needed a web, which acts like a little bridge between the, the ties or the sleepers. And they needed a big head because that wore. And see, you see all the different shapes. They tried U rail and everything else. And then finally, Bessemer. Um, Steel Company came up with this this uh, the rail that we we are now familiar with a big wide web uh, or excuse me a base and then a and, and then a web and then a head mm -hmm. and the common sizes uh, there was forty five pound uh, very very light lines and then sixty pound a lot of the uh, uh, sidings around here and the old uh, branch lines were sixty pound that's why for example in Canada. They use uh, the system boxes for years after uh, after the, the center flows came out because they didn't they only had sixty pound rail they couldn't haul the the hundred ton um, uh, center flows on it right. and then ninety yeah. pound like the Sioux line was mostly ninety pound and then they on the main line they they went to one hundred fifteen and that was common for many years um, and then then they went to this the uh, Pensy and the and the uh, New York or uh, Norfolk and Western. As you were talking about, Craig, the uh, the steam engines really pounded the hell out of the rail. Right. Sure and so they, they uh, in fact, the Norfolk and Western and the Pensy both had 155 pound rail. Now that's yeah. some serious rail. But now that's with an the expensive diesels, railroad. Yeah. Uh, now with the, the diesels, they use 132, 136, something like that. It's pretty much standardized. Which interestingly, they call it light rail, but the uh, light rail systems use 136 welded. Because it's low maintenance and smooth ride. Uh, uh -huh. So here's another museum where they had, uh, this is probably 40, 45 pound rail and some some wooden cars. And uh, they, they would haul them with, uh, well, originally with, with horses and then later with a small steam engine. And and uh, like you're saying, Bob, they bring they bring stuff out of the mine on, on tracks. Early, early on, it was wood. And then later they built you know, T-rails and, and, because uh, again, they found it was a lot easier to, for the horse to haul coal if, uh, if it's, if the, the, the wagon is on wheels. So yeah. then in, later, this is, this is uh, in an underground mile, mine in the eastern part of the United States, and it's a regular railroad track then. And then they have these electric <clears throat> carts uh, with a, the, there's a shoe inside this thing, um, like a trolley, uh, like a streetcar. Mm -hmm. But they had to they had to contain it with a rubber uh, seal as best they could because they didn't they didn't want oh. any sparks with all the coal methane. <laughs> yeah, with all the methane because mines are you know when they mine the coal methane is released. Oh um, yeah, yeah. So you have water pipes with water, and then you had to blow fresh air in and suck the methane out, and um, and 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 uh, uh, but at least this allowed them to get the the coal out. Um. Now, interestingly, the steam engine didn't come along till later. This is in the uh, late 1700s. The uh, Richard Arkwright, um, I mean, that's probably where Arkwrights came from. I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, they he, he just said, well, we have steam engines. Well, let's use this for textile mills. So then they would 
then has this big flywheel, and then the piston would go back and forth and turn this flywheel. And then this this little device here is the governor, which was driven, and, and these balls would, would spin out further due to centrifugal force, and that would close okay. the valve. So it would actually be able to operate at constant speed. And then this this thing would be the the big uh, wheel would be would be driving rods all over the factory, which we always see with with uh, canvas belts going to all the the uh, sewing machines and cutters and all that stuff. And then it was uh, Richard Tevithick had an iron ore mine in 1804. He built the first steam locomotive um, uh, that for for hauling iron ore out of the mine this kind of a device here but of course the one way i was here about is george stevenson he built the first steam locomotive for a public railroad he's the one that kind of really settled things that to to have a boiler and full of water and then and then fire tubes a fire smoke box over here or a fire box over here and then smokes uh he he said well we'll We'll use the pist the pistons will use the steam and then we'll exhaust it into a nozzle and blow it out the, the uh, chimney. So that sucks the air and the fire through the through the boiler. Through the tubes, right. Through the tubes, yeah. Oh, through the, yeah. the fire tubes in the boiler. And um, and of course, by the uh, 1850s, this is a, a rest restored American type of locomotive, and there were thousands of these around the United States. Um, for wheels in front to pull the locomotive around the curve, especially because the track was pretty rough. And then four big drivers. And then of course the cab, the firebox, and then the boiler, and then the smoke box. And then they had to have a big, because um, they were burning wood. So they'd have a big screen up here and that would catch the cinders and then they would just fall down in the, in the chimney. And so the four wheels here pulled the front of the locomotive out of, uh, out of the, around curves. If they're backing up, then the, then these acted as as a as a truck. The tender would pull the locomotive if they had to back up at any any speed at all. And of course, as as um, uh, the eighteen hundreds went on, the, the engines got bigger, faster, cars got heavier, and so this shows the Pacific uh, mm -hmm. late in the eighteen hundreds uh, running along. And then they got bigger and bigger. And as we've talked about different types of steam engines, this is by uh, by the 30s. Uh, this is a, a Baltimore and Ohio M1 articulated locomotive, and it was they were huge. And this is he has probably a mile of coal cars behind him. Um, and so they got very very large. Now the coal cars themselves, we saw some of those early ones, and then gradually they put uh, bogies, as they call them in Eng uh, England or the, or Europe, or trucks, as we call them here, four wheel trucks. And for, at first they were wood, and uh, then they they uh, eventually went to metal. And they all used gondolas at first. They didn't have hoppers. It took them a while to figure out hoppers. So here's some here's some gondolas, and then um, here's a <laughs> Detroit Mackinac gondola that's it's seen it's it's been well used. <laughs> yeah. The rust is holding it together, I think. Yeah, all right. Then finally, um, they they came up with the hopper, and these are the standard hoppers they had in the starting in about the twenties, with a with a hopper here, and then a hopper here, and then four um, doors down here that they the op, the operator would come along and just unlatch it, and then the coal would fall out. And if it got stuck, then they'd have to put bring over a um, they had a crane above the unloading facility, and then they'd shake the car. They had a big uh, machine they'd set on it with a with a that would rotate. It had a rotating weight and a cam inside, and it would just rotate, shake the car, and then all the coal would come out. And so here's a here's a uh, Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western uh, holding anthracite, but same type of thing. These were these were seventy ton, one hundred and forty thousand pound. Or, or not, excuse me, these were fifty ton, hundred thousand pound cars. And and here's a standard. Uh, uh, Louisville and Nashville car, and uh, here's a here's a whole train of them someplace out. Uh, um, not sure if that's west or east, but a early uh, GP nine, a uh, GP seven, pulling a whole string of probably a mine run coming from a mine someplace. And then they went to the um, 
Uh, they went to four doors. These are the quad, they call quad hoppers because they had a copper here and then it was a little <laughs> divider here and then another. Uh, and so the operator would unlatch each of these doors and the two doors were tied together. So they just went, went down one side, unlatched <laughs> it, and then they had to latch them up again and when it was empty. And these these get to be 140,000 pounds, 70 tons. And uh, then in the 70s, um, they came up with the, the hunt so they could start using 100 ton cars and so then they came up with this design uh which is is three uh hoppers in here double hoppers and so there's six doors but i used to watch the uh, operators unload these things and they'd unlatch them and uh this door would swing open and the coal would come out but then they had to swing this door back and forth and there were a lot of back injuries uh with these types of cars hmm. and and um so here's a pennsylvania and uh, there's a southern, and and uh, here's a uh, train of them on the on the uh, Chesapeake and Ohio with an F unit and a GP nine, probably coming from a mine someplace. Well, so then then they, um, as we were talking earlier with about that train coming in that uh, Craig you saw, they mm -hmm. they said, gee, maybe we could uh, uh, have the doors open pneumatically. It would be faster, and then we employees wouldn't be injured. And so they came up with these, they call them rapid discharge cars. And you can see it's got a special reservoir here. So as the train oh. runs along, it fills this reservoir. It's a separate <laughs> system. And so then the operator comes along, and he just throws a valve, and all eight or ten of these doors just slam open. Okay. And so the, almost the whole bottom of the car is open, and the coal falls out. And and uh, they usually often don't have to shake them, which is nice for the aluminum. Aluminum cars don't do well. Here's an aluminum one. This is steel. Um, but they but the uh, and then they can unload them much much quicker.